all the time. We get headlines all the time about computers making great advances in all kinds of areas of vision, language, robotics, and so on. Um, you know, the big companies like Google, Facebook, um, Microsoft, and so on have produced programs that can do quite amazing things. And we've been promised for a long time that we're going to have all kinds of everyday uh, AI systems like self-driving cars um, that are going to take over the roads. And in fact, this last headline was predicting that we'd have many self-driving cars by 2020. That was actually a popular year to make predictions, but it hasn't happened yet. And the question is like, why is it that some of these promised advances in AI Ha, are not um, occurring as fast as people had predicted them? And why do people tend to be very over-optimistic about how well AI will be able to be integrated into our lives? So here's a quote from an AI expert who says, perhaps expectations are too high and this will eventually result in disaster. Suppose five years from now, Funding collapses as autonomous vehicles fail to roll. Every startup company fails and there's a big backlash. So you can't get anything, money for anything connected with AI. Everybody hurriedly changes the names of their research projects to something else. This condition is called the AI winter. Well, this was um, <clears throat> written by Drew McDermott, an AI researcher at Yale University in 1984. So talking about this, um, cycling that the field of AI has between high optimism and promises and then over optimism, promises not um, panning out and people becoming very disappointed. And people have called the, the phase where people are disappointed in AI and funding kind of dries up is the AI winters. And ever since the beginning of AI, we've had several cycles of winters and springs, you might say, where people are very optimistic, uh, followed by pessimism. In fact, I graduated from my PhD program in 1990 when an, oh, an AI winter was in effect. And I was advised not to use the term artificial intelligence on my job applications. Hard to imagine now when AI is in such a sort of a spring condition where everyone is so optimistic and it's gaining so much, uh, uh, it's kind of a hype in the field. <clears throat> so the kind of predictions about AI go way back to the very beginning in the 1950s and 60s. Someone as prominent as Claude Shannon, founder of information theory, predicted in 1961 that within 10 to 15, years, we'd see, as he called it, something like the robots of science fiction fame. And Har Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winner in economics and an AI pioneer, predicted in 1965 that within 20 years, uh, machines would be capable of doing any work that a man could do. You know, the, notice the sexist language of the 1960s. Um, but you get the idea. In a couple years later, Marvin Minsky, founder of the MIT AI iLab predicted that within a generation, that's maybe uh, 20 to 25 years, the problem of creating AI would be substantially solved. Okay, none of these things actually happened in the time frame predicted. And later, one of the another AI pioneer, John McCarthy, said that, well, the problem is AI was harder than we thought. Indeed. So I wrote a paper recently called Why AI is Harder Than We Think. And I should have called it Why It's Still Harder Than We Think, because I think a lot of the same patterns are repeating themselves. For instance, we have uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook saying um, a, a few years ago that one of the goals of Facebook's research is to, within the next five to 10 years, and he said this in 2015, to get better better than human level at what he called all the primary human senses, vision, hearing, language, and general cognition. Um, more recently, Elon Musk 
uh, uh, CEO of Tesla, um, tweeted on Twitter that he thought that 2029 feels like a pivotal year. He'd be surprised if we don't have artificial general intelligence by then, hopefully people on Mars too. Okay. So now we see this new optimism and prediction about AI. Well, these uh, heads of companies and billionaires may not uh, reflect what AI researchers are saying, but in fact, AI, some AI researchers are almost as optimistic. For instance, Richard Sutton, who is um, a very important uh, researcher on reinforcement learning, gave a 50% probability estimate of human level AI by 2040, just re recently. And just a couple of years ago, uh, Stuart Russell, who's an author of uh, the primary textbook that students use in AI and also um, an important researcher, asked in his recent book, when will super intelligent AI arrive? And he thought it, he predicted it will probably happen within the lifetime of his children, which he says is considerably more conservative than that of typical AI researchers. So we're seeing this optimism all over the place, largely the rise of um, uh, deep learning, which is a method for using very large neural networks and massive uh, uh, sets of data and very fast uh, parallel compute power to produce uh, systems that have recently seemingly re revolutionized um, many AI applications. However, these systems have some limitations. And I'm going to talk about some of those and why they're relevant to people's predictions about how soon we're going to see something like human level AI. One of the problems is what's called shortcut learning. I'll talk about that. Another issue is called adversarial vulnerability and more generally a lack of what we might call common sense. Okay, so shortcut learning is um, a phenomenon where a, a machine learning system is trained on a particular task defined by humans, does very well on that task, at least as evidenced by benchmark data sets that it's tested on, but actually didn't learn to perform the task in any way that the human thought would be, uh, would define performing the task. So as one example, in my own lab, uh, one of the uh, graduate students working with me trained a deep neural network to recognize whether an um, image contained an animal or not. Okay, so he had a large uh, set of nature photographs like these, and the system was trained and then tested on such photographs and ended up having very high accuracy. But had it learned to determine if an animal was in the image? Well, when my student tried to analyze what exactly the machine had learned, it turned out that it was <clears throat> focusing more on the background of these images than on the foreground, the animal. And it seems like what it had learned was to associate blurry backgrounds with images that had animals, because in this data it was trained on, obviously the photographer there's an animal that's around and the background is blurry, where in the landscapes where there's no animal, the background is clear. And so what the mach machine seems to have learned is that this statistical association with blurry backgrounds and animals, it's much easier to identify a blurry background than it is to identify an animal. And that's what the uh, system has learned. That's called shortcut learning. The system's learned a shortcut to do well on the data it's tested on, but it hasn't actually learned the task trying to teach it. And this happens quite often in machine learning. Here's one, uh, a paper that uh, was published in 2018 that showed that a deep neural network that was very good at identifying objects like this, a school bus with 100% uh, confidence, when that, those uh, objects were photoshopped into different poses and magnifications, the, neural net, the same neural network was very convinced with 99% confidence that this was a garbage truck or a punching bag or here a snowplow. 
So somehow the neural network is focusing on certain features of these images to come up with these classifications, these very confident classifications that are very different from what a human would see in the image. And therefore these neural networks lack robustness. Uh, a similar uh, experiment with fire trucks um, showed that it was easy to convince the neural network that this was a school bus or a fire boat or a bobsled. And, you know, this was kind of an amusing paper called Neural Networks Are Easily Fooled by Strange Poses of Familiar Objects, but it can have some repercussions in the real world when these systems are deployed. So, you know, we've seen in self-driving cars situations where, a, a, say, a Tesla car running on its autopilot software has crashed into a, a stopped fire truck on the highway, perhaps uh, not recognizing it as a fire truck in this unusual pose. <clears throat> a second problem is adversarial vulnerability. That is that these systems are vulnerable to what are called adversarial examples. So probably some of you have seen this work before where um, this group, this was way back in 2013, uh, showed that you could take an image that was recognized correctly by a deep neural network um, and add some perturbations to the pixels. This is, this is, this is a very highly magnified uh, image of the perturbations. In fact, when you add this image to this image, it turns out that it looks identical to us as humans, but the perturbations were engineered to cause the neural network to very confidently predict that these uh, images on the right are ostriches. And similarly over here, you know, and you, you, it's hard for us to even, sorry, it's hard for us as humans to understand what's going on here because, you know, these look identical to us. And yet it's not hard to engineer unde undetectable changes to images and choose any category you want and have that category, the image be mistaken for that category. So they, they called this paper intriguing properties of neural networks, which seems to be an understatement. It's really a quite a alarming property of a neural network that many people have taken further. And even today, these so-called adversarial attacks on neural networks still have not been, uh, is, we've not found any general defense against them that can, can defend any um, neural network against these kinds of attacks. Uh, this is a more recent one um, where a group at um, Carnegie Mellon University showed that you could um, create, design these glasses frames that they, which have this weird looking colored pattern, which are designed to fool facial recognition systems. And in fact, um, for instance, this particular pattern being worn by one of the authors of the paper fooled a deep neural network facial recognition system to think that he was the actress Mila Jovovich. So somehow these networks are these perceiving pixels in these images and causing them to have um, certain errors that seem almost incomprehensible to us as humans. Uh, this is another example of a physical adversarial attack where a group showed that you could put stickers on stop signs and even a camera on a self-driving car looking at them, looking at the stop sign from different angles and different uh, distances was fooled into thinking this was a speed limit 80 sign in most of these conditions. So these kinds of vulnerabilities show that these networks are perceiving their data in a very different way than humans perceive it. Finally, a lot of people in the AI are quite <clears throat> interested in the idea of common sense, of trying to give machines uh, something like our common sense, which they currently lack. So one example of this is that um, it turns out that the most common accident involving these experimental self-driving cars are that humans rear-end them. That means that 
the self-driving car slams on the brakes unexpectedly and a human not expecting it who's driving behind them then crashes into them. Uh, and the reason is that these self-driving cars, their vision systems are perceiving obstacles where no human would perceive them. And they're slamming on the brakes and they're kind of unpredictable because they don't have common sense. They perhaps might not know that a floating plastic bag in the road isn't something that you should slam on the brakes for. You can just drive right past it. Or here in uh, New Mexico, where I live, we see things like these tumbleweeds on the road. We know that, we humans know that the tumbleweeds are not, you know, they're not solid. Uh, you can drive right through them and they'll just disintegrate, but self-driving car doesn't know that. Uh, we know that if, if you drive up to a flock of birds on the road, the birds will fly away. We know that they're alive and that they are, have the ability to fly, but how does a self-driving car learn that? or even more kind of on the edge here, we know that um, this snowman in the middle of the road isn't going to cross the road in front of your car like a pedestrian. So these people in the um, self-driving car research uh, community call these edge cases, weird things that happen to cars that might not appear in the training data but the number of edge cases, of possible edge cases is so large, so many different things can happen to you when you're driving that uh, you really need some kind of common sense to deal with. Uh, that any self-driving car is going to encounter at least some edge case at some time. And so if you have millions of them on the road, this kind of thing is gonna happen quite often. So how do you give machines common sense? Here's another example where a self-driving car camera uh, perceives this, this is a car, but these, paint, these paintings on the back of the car, there's sort of, sort of photographs of bicyclists, it perceives they're actual bicycles. It doesn't, can't distinguish between them. Or here's an example of the need for common sense. Um, this guy tweeted that his car kept slamming on the brakes in this area that had no stop sign. Why? This is his Tesla on autopilot until he noticed that this billboard had a sheriff with a stop sign advertising something or other. Uh, no, he, no human would mistake this for a real stop sign and yet the self-driving car couldn't tell the difference. Um, one AI researcher called common sense the dark matter of artificial intelligence, dark matter being analogous with physical dark matter, which is something that in the universe is everywhere, and yet we don't really understand what it is. So similarly, common sense is all around us in our um, in world, and yet we don't understand how to uh, implement common sense in machines. So a lot of people like Paul Allen, the former um, co-founder of Microsoft, before he died uh, a few years ago, he started his own institute on AI to teach computers common sense. The United States Department of Defense is putting a lot of money into funding machine common sense, but it's still a very much open problem. So I wrote a, a paper a couple of years ago on why AI is harder than we think trying to give some reasons why I think we have these recurring cycles of optimism and pessimism. And I noted some fallacies that I think affect uh, not only the general public, but also AI researchers. So the first fallacy I talked about is the idea that narrow AI is on a continuum with general AI. So, you know, the kinds of AI systems that can do relatively narrow tasks very well, like playing go or driving on a highway or something like that, but they can't do anything else. Uh, <clears throat> we assume that progress on this narrow kind of AI is a step towards progress on general AI, and that may not be true, but people claim it. So IBM, for instance, claimed that its Watson program was a first step into cognitive systems, which was their term for general AI. Alpha Zero, the program that 
learned how to play Go and chess and so on, was called the first step in creating real AI. GPT-2, which was the predecessor of the famous GPT-3 text generation program, was called a step towards general intelligence. And all of these, uh, the philosopher Hubert Dreyfus referred to as the first step fallacy. He actually wrote this before any of these comments were made, but he said it's the claim since that, you know, ever since our first work on computer intelligence, we've been inching along this continuum so that if we have improvement in narrow AI systems, we believe that that's on the continuum to general AI. He claimed that there was no continuum, that there was a discontinuity, and he called it the common sense knowledge problem. <clears throat> and uh, um, his brother, Stuart Dreyfus, wrote that it, analogously, it's like claiming that the first monkey that climbed a tree was making progress toward landing on the moon. And his point was that instead, we have to like climb down from the tree and build a rocket ship. But it may be that, you know, the top of the tree is this where we are with deep learning and it's not gonna get us to the moon. My second fallacy was uh, called easy things are easy and hard things are hard. So yeah, this seems tautological, but what I meant by it is that we assume that things that are easy for us as humans are going to be also the easiest things for computers and vice versa. For example, the uh, Herbert Simon, who I talked about earlier, once said that everything of interest in cognition happens above the 100 sec millisecond level, the time it takes to recognize your mother, saying that we can kind of ignore all that unconscious perceptual processing that happens within the first 100 milliseconds of seeing a person, for example. And we only have to model or capture what's happening uh, at, at longer time scales. <clears throat> the things that are super easy for us that we don't even know we're doing, we don't have to worry about in AI. Uh, more recently, Andrew Ng, who's a very well-known deep learning pioneer, said something similar. He said, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. A little bit more subtly, Demis Hasibis, the co-founder of uh, DeepMind, talking about the game Go, he called it one of the most challenging of domains. But the question is, challenging for whom? You know, if, is it challenging? It's certainly challenging for humans, but is it one of the most challenging of domains for AI? If once we have an AI that conquers Go, does that mean that we've conquered the most challenging of domains? Or as the psychologist Gary Marcus pointed out, a much simpler game for us like charades, which any six-year-old could play, is much more challenging for AI because it involves movement, and uh, theory of mind, emotional intelligence, language processing, and so on. So this is, uh, been, was summed up much earlier by uh, Hans Moravac, um, a, a, an AI researcher who, who coined this paradox. He said, it's comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers. So even later playing or and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. And I would add common sense. In fact, one of the grand challenge problems set up by uh, DARPA, which is one of the uh, funding agencies for um, AI in the United States, is to give a computer the common sense of an 18-month-old baby. Marvin Mitchell, Insky, who I quoted earlier, much uh, uh, very optimistic about AI, said um, that in general, much later he said this, in general, we're least aware of what our minds do best, which makes us overly optimistic about that easy things for us will be easy for AI systems. Okay, the third um, fallacy I call the lure of wishful mnemonics. This word wishful mnemonics, um, 
came from a paper written in 1976 by Drew McDermott, Yale AI researcher, who was complaining about people anthropomorphizing their AI systems. For instance, calling a program or a subroutine of a program understand, and then assuming that it understands. And he said, well, people should instead refer to this main loop as G0034 and see if they can convince themselves uh, that it implements sort of understanding. And he said, many instructive examples of wishful mnemonics by AI researchers come to mind once you see the point. Well, this was back in 1976, but I think even now we have a lot of wishful mnemonics. So, you know, one example came from IBM's Watson, where IBM claimed that Watson could read all of the healthcare texts in the world in seconds. Well, read here is a wishful mnemonic. By that means it's kind of a shorthand for Watson being able to process language very quickly. But what it was doing was not the same thing as what humans do when they read, which implies understanding in some a significant way what they read, which Watson did not. And here we get understands, but we also get subtle, subtle uh, terms like goal. This is something that uh, DeepMind researchers said about AlphaGo. They said AlphaGo's goal is to beat the best human players, not just mimic them. Well, clearly AlphaGo doesn't really have a goal like that. It doesn't even know in some sense that it's playing a game. And this anthropomorphizes what the system is doing. We have benchmark data sets that we name with, we give the name of the task we want to solve, like the reading comprehension data set, or common sense understanding data set, or general language understanding evaluation data set. These are all real names of data sets that people test their machine learning programs on. And when those systems outperform humans on those data sets, which they have in all cases, then we get headlines like, AI now better at reading comprehension than humans because it did better on a data set called reading comprehension or AI better at language, general language understanding than humans. But it turns out that like my uh, example of the animal versus no animal task, a lot of what the systems are doing on these benchmark data sets are shortcut learning. They're not actually doing the general task of reading comprehension or common sense understanding or understanding language. And we uh, have, but however, we can fool ourselves by just these wishful mnemonics. Even more, more uh, kind of subtly, we call our methods deep learning, which has a lot of associations with human learning, even though that these methods are very different from human learning or neural networks, which have associations with the brain, even though these networks are very different from the way the brain works. And finally, um, we have wishful mnemonics in the descriptions of what machines have learned. So let me give you an example. Uh, Google DeepMind, one of the things that they did before they became part of Google was they um, pioneered this uh, method called deep Q learning, which was a kind of reinforcement learning using neural network, deep neural networks. And it learned to play Atari video games from back from the 1970s, just by uh, observing the pixels of the video and ma making actions and observing rewards. This is a game called Breakout, where you have a, a paddle here, where the paddle is moved back and forth by the player and it hits this little ball that then um, is used to um, collide with these bricks and you, it, they explode. And the higher in, in, in it here um, the bricks are, the more valuable they are. And they, here's what DeepMind said it, um, the system learned. After 600 ep episodes, the Deep Q network finds and exploits the optimal strategy in this game, which is to make a tunnel around the side here and then allow the ball to hit blocks by bouncing behind the wall. So it just, you know, you make this tunnel and then it can by itself without you, the player having to do anything, just destroy the most valuable bricks. But notice here, these descriptions of these concepts, these human concepts like tunnel, ball, blocks, wall. These are all 
concepts that a human would use to play the game, to, to think of this strategy. But did this system actually learn these concepts? Well, it turns out that it didn't. And this was shown by um, a paper that um, experimented with very small changes in the game, like moving the paddle up by a few pixels. So a, a, a deep Q network that had been trained on the, this standard version of the game and could do that tunneling strategy was tested on this new version of the game. The only difference is that the paddle was moved up by a few pixels. It really shouldn't change anything at all about the strategy, but that, that um, system that learned on this standard version couldn't play this version. It couldn't carry out that strategy on this version, which showed that it had not actually learned these concepts of like tunnel and ball and paddle and so on. Instead, it was responding to very spe more specific configurations of pixels and hadn't learned the concepts that people attribute to it that make them more optimistic that it's going to be as robust as a human would be. The final fallacy I talked about and the one I got the most pushback on was that the fallacy that intelligence is all in the brain. So there's this uh, thought experiment in philosophy where people think about having a brain in a vat. There's, there's no body, just the brain in the vat. And uh, inputs come into the brain from some kind of sensors and then the outputs come out of the brain and um, then cause some kind of actuators to do things. So could this be intelligence? Could we have, could we build something like this and have it be intelligent? Well, essentially this is what an AI system is. You know, it's not exactly a brain, but it's something, it's like an isolated uh, system inside your computer, sorry, that um, gets inputs through the computer system and has outputs. Uh, and people assume that these systems will be able to become intelligent. But a lot of psychologists, oh, I should say first, this is you know, implied by quite a lot of papers and headlines. You know, People think about all we need to do is get to the computational power of the human brain, and then we'll be able to get artificial intelligence. But this it, it ignores a lot of ideas from cognitive science in which the body itself plays a huge role in our under intelligence and our understanding of the world and this notion of embodied cognition. So all of these things that I mentioned, these fallacies I claim make people more optimistic about how soon we'll get to um, human level AI than perhaps they should be. But they also spur a number of open questions. If narrow AI is not on a continuum with general AI, how do we assess actual progress towards general AI? If things that are easy for us are not easy for machines and vice versa, how do we actually assess the difficulty of a domain for AI? How can we talk to ourselves about what machines can and can't do without fooling ourselves with wishful mnemonics? And if how, how embodied or social, socially, culturally embedded does intelligence really need to be? So I think that to answer these questions, and I don't have answers, but I think they're important questions for assessing our field, we have to have a better understanding of what the target of AI is, what this thing we call intelligence or general intelligence or human level intelligence. I don't think we understand it well enough to make an assessment of where we are on AI and who, how soon we'll accomplish sort of this fuzzy goal of true or uh, human-like or super intelligent AI. I talk about all of these issues a lot more in my recent book, and I'm happy to answer any questions or hear your thoughts on these. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie. Very interesting uh, discussions. And uh, I, I'm sure that we are going to have nice questions now. So everyone, please uh, type your questions in the chat and I will go over them as we have time. I would like to, to start with um, a very hard question. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you mentioned that uh, two problems that um, quickly show that we are not in the path of AGI is the shortcut learning and the adversarial uh, attack um, propensity, like uh, the systems being uh, easily fooled. Mm -hmm. So do you see as a researcher any positive uh, research in the direction of dealing with shortcut learning and uh, something that we could do during the learning that could avoid it and the same for adversarial attacks? Yes. So, um, it's just one of the problems, uh, one of the things that makes AI systems very different from humans is that they, today's AI systems need to learn on many, many examples. And, you know, you guys showed that with the sort of animal, no animal task. It needed a large number of examples of each category. And therefore it was able to, because it had so many examples, it was able to find st sort of statistical uh, correlations that weren't necessarily relevant to the task, but allowed it to make, get the right answer, maybe for the wrong reason. Uh, and those kinds of statistical correlations are inevitable in any very large data set. So I think that humans who learn on much smaller numbers of examples um, don't have the opportunity to learn those kinds of statistical correlations. And therefore, this idea of learning on smaller sets of examples, which is often called few shot learning, is going to be essential to avoiding the, that kind of problem. Um, the problem of adversarial examples has to do with, um, at least in part, with the fact that when a neural network, for example, learns from, is trained from data, um, it basically um, has, it learns sort of <laughs> a very, um, what, what people call high dimensional representation of, um, of the, the possible space of categories. So like school bus and ostrich are two possible categories. And all the examples that are school buses are mapped into one part of the space and all the examples that are ostriches are mapped into another part of the space where the space is you know, very high dimensional. And that kind of uh, learning approach isn't, it's very different than what, how we humans learn uh, where we're sort of able to uh, learn, map our um, understanding to a much lower dimensional space. And so I think that kind of approach is going to be much more robust to these kinds of adversarial attacks. And there's lots of people working on both of those things. Yeah. So, yeah. but, you know, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Right. I agree. Um, the more I study AI, the more I have um, the thinking that I don't know if you really gain something while focusing on AGI. I, I'm not sure what we're gonna have to gain in terms of human flourish, flourishment if we have like algorithms that think like us, that act like us, that can eventually replace us. So instead, I think that perhaps we should focus on just solving problems and not seeking algorithms that could have AGI, something like that. And this goes in line with the question here from Camila, my student. So should our goal be just to make AI uh, to solve problems or to solve problems the way humans do? So what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, in some cases it's, it's, definitely advantageous to have AI systems solve problems in different way than humans. You know, one example of that is the recent work on um, predicting protein structure from sequences that DeepMind did. And their system was better than any previous system precisely because it did something very different from humans. It found patterns in the data that were very different from the patterns humans were able to find. Okay, but in other cases, think about self-driving cars. 
do we want our self driving cars to be thinking differently from us, namely to be recognizing objects in a way that's different from the way we recognize objects? Certainly not. We want them to, they're gonna be interacting with us. They're gonna be interacting with our constructed world. We have to have them recognize uh, the world in the same way we do and be able to predict humans and what pedestrians and other drivers are going to do. So I think it depends on the, the domain and maybe we don't want want to have autonomous vehicles or other autonomous systems. That's something, you know, a societal question. But if we do want them, we certainly want them to think like us. So that's how I think about that issue. That's a good point. And to be safe, right? As a researcher in the field right now, I don't have the courage to step in one of those cars yet. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Uh, I have here uh, Bruno. Welcome, Bruno. Uh, cognitive biases are part of normal human cognition. They are not largely explainable, but some seem to have an evolutionary role. So human level intelligence should also embrace cognitive biases. Do you agree with that? That's a very hard question, okay, because we don't totally understand the evolutionary role of cognitive biases. <clears throat> so, you know, the there's some in the AI world who think that we can kind of have have it both ways. We can have systems that are have human level intelligence but don't have any of our biases, or going even further, you know, those pesky things like our, us getting bored or having to sleep and eat, and all of those things that slow us down. Other people think that no, it's. It, as as you say, cognitive biases are inseparable from co our cognitive advantages. I don't think anyone knows the answer because we don't really understand intelligence well enough. But I would I'm more on the second side. I you know in my intuition that that I don't think we can separate these things so easily. But I I you know not everyone in AI agrees with that. And it's a, it's a very nice point as well, because recently I started reading this book, it's called The Loop. And in, in this book, the author argues exactly what you're saying, that many of the cognitive biases that we have, evolutionary speaking, they helped us survive up to this point. So it's kind of inseparable of our, our advantages as well. So it's a nice point. Yeah. I have here Hector. Uh, welcome, Hector. Thank you for joining. First of all, thank you. I, I'm going to say exactly like he said, very much for your work. It helped me a lot in my career and made me fall in love uh, by sci-fi. Um, then the question, do you think that in some cases the absence of common sense can be a good characteristic? Reducing the biases, for example, <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that that addresses both questions before, because yeah, certainly lack of common sense can, you know, what we call common sense maybe can enhance creativity in some cases and make machines think outside the box and all of that. But again, in some cases it can be harmful, like as I showed with the self-driving cars. Uh, so. <laughs> you know, we often we there there's a a very um fine line between extremely creative people and um crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like how much we're allowing a common sense to slip, right? Right. Uh and so that's a that's an interesting uh, bias is how, how it can be good in some cases, but not, you know, we kind of have to figure out which cases that's true, in which cases it's not. Exactly. I have now Simone. Uh, all difficult questions today, and uh, this is a sign of the, the talk was very good. Do you believe that digital discrete technologies are now, or will ever be able to fully represent and reason about us humans and our analog continuous world, including analog analogical reasoning? Uh, yeah, that's another question that is hard I don't know the answer, although you know, discrete systems can um, approximate continuous systems as to whatever degree you want. So the question is, 
how, you know, we know that there are some continuous systems in the brain, you know, that we have continuous concentrations of chemicals and so on. Um, but uh, does it, how much does that really matter? How, uh, how good can an approximation be or how, how much do we need, you know, to approximate these things? Nobody really knows the answer to that. I think most neuroscientists would probably say, well, the, you know, the whole point of neural firing is to discretize these continuous values. And we can actually capture much of what we need to about the brain using these discrete quantities. But I don't, you know, the, I, it's still an open question. Okay, nice. From Gabriel now, congratulations on the presentation, very reflective. Could common sense be modeled as a representation of reality to address a specific problem? For example, in the case of the stop sign, common sense would be to differentiate traffic signs from advertisements. Intuitively, that's what I do when I drive. I look only at the important elements for the test. In this case, wouldn't it be possible to model the problem on two levels, making the AI look only at the traffic signs? Well, looking, figuring out what are the important elements in the task is, is like a key to intelligence, right? Exactly. So, and and to, to, to ask, can the AI look only at traffic signs? Well, figuring out what are the traffic signs is, is a hard problem. <laughs> when you have pictures of traffic signs and real world traffic signs and, you know, uh, maybe things that look like traffic signs, but aren't. So it's all, you know, we use a lot of context in our ability to perceive what's going on in situations like that. We, we use the context of, and we've learned throughout our lifetimes, like what context is important and how, how to use it. Probably we have some innate biases that help us do that. The question is figuring out what those are and how to get them in machines. So that's, a, that's the hard problem. So I think you pointed out, yes, absolutely. You have to look for just the important elements, but what is important depends on the context and is a huge problem itself, how to figure that what, out what those are. And I think that it goes also in the direction of what you said earlier, uh, incorporating this context, understanding the context, it's, it's also related to the fact that the intelligence is not only in the brain because your whole body is getting the context, right? Everything is working in a synchronous way to detect the context and help you take these decisions. And I, I think that would be the next frontier for AI to incorporate uh, more info about the context uh, of the world and not only to get some signals in and process and take some action. Now I have another, another question for you. Um, you mentioned uh, some fallacies related to, to AI. The first one is this continuum. And um, every now and then we see some, uh, normally some news outlets, uh, journalists, they say, um, AI is coming, there is no way it's not coming. And recently, two weeks ago, I think, with uh, the Gato solution that was released. And uh, the first one that was able to like uh, deal with 500, 600 tasks. And the other day, all of the media were saying, uh, well, AI is in a continuum and it's coming. AI is like uh, just some steps away. But this goes in this fallacy of the continuum that you mentioned. Um, how do you see, how, how could we break this thinking um, of this continuum and, and really focus on, on the hard problems that we have in AI to help us solve real world problems like the biases, like a climate change and things that we should drive the algorithms to help us solve and, and, and not be in this continuous thinking that uh, each epsilon that we improve, we are closer to AGI. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know, uh, it, you know, that there's a lot of issues wrapped up in that, what you just said, you know, one is how do we think, you know, how do we understand intelligence more? How do we kind of understand the limitations of 
AI systems, what do we really want these AI systems to do? Well, you know, do we want them to replace replace us or do we want them to augment us? And these are all things that are getting in, discussed, of course, intensely in the community. And um, I think, you know, one problem is that the general public doesn't understand much about technology and about, or about intelligence. <laughs> and uh, this, you know, educating the general public is something that we as scientists uh, are responsible for, I think. We have to be doing a better job. And it, it's difficult because a lot of, you know, AI has now gone beyond uh, kind of a sort of uh, scientific or, or, or research discipline has become commercial. And so companies make money because they promote their products that are based on AI. And so of course they're gonna hype the products. Of course they're going to yes. focus on you know, what they can do. And so the, this is just a very uh, systematic, uh, complex systems kind of issue. It's like, there's a lot of different forces uh, that are pushing AI in certain directions and not in others. Uh, how to how to solve that? I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. So personally speaking, now your opinion, you are more like the one that uh, would like to have AI solutions to augment us, or are you you are okay with like a seeking AGI and at some point having algorithms that I could in somehow. Uh, could somehow replace some things that we do. So uh, what what are the dangers and, and pros and cons that you see in both ways? Sure. I mean, you know, throughout technology, even before AI, we, we technology has replaced some of the things that we do. Uh, you know, in my book, I talk about one example. There, there, there used to be a job in, say, uh, the, uh, India of fanning fanning the poor people would be fanning the rich people who are yeah, in a hot room yeah. right that was their job just do that all day long okay and so so electricity came along and we could create electric fans and uh replace those people okay we sort of see that as a good thing right very boring uh unfulfilling job uh that has been replaced by technology and there's just any number of examples of that um but um, so so that's not necessarily a bad thing to, to have systems, autonomous systems that replace us doing things. But then we have to ask sort of how far do we want that to go? Uh, clearly, we don't want AI systems to replace us in all of our endeavors. Um, and um, I think that, you know, we have to really understand what we, as a society, not just relying on like tech giants to, to decide for us what we want these systems to have to do. So I think AI, you know, I, I encourage students who are interested in AI, but are not necessarily technical or want to, you know, become software engineers or what not, people who are interested in more social problems, that there is a role for you in this field, because we urgently need people to think about what it is we really want these systems to do. And, uh, without you know, preventing the beneficial possibilities of technologies, but preventing the more unbeneficial uh, uh, applications. So I think it's a job for social scientists, for philosophers, for hu humanists and so on. And they have to become part of this, this discussion. Excellent points. And you mentioned the tech giants, and we know that pretty much seven or nine of them are basically driving the research in AI and, and technology in general nowadays. So do, do you think that governments around the world should do some kind of legislation about this, like to go in the direction of the discussions that you mentioned, uh, to provide some... Uh, control or, or or possibilities against like this domination of seven to nine companies because they are getting so big that they are already bigger than many governments and <laughs> uh, at the rate that they are uh, uh, increasing they are growing uh, probably they will be together they will be bigger than 
any government in the near future. So how, how do you see this? Uh, how, how society can uh, work together to first um, discuss more about possible legislations to help us decide uh, the directions of good AI, bad AI, and second, um, how do you see this dominance of these nine big companies? Well, I think what you said is correct. These companies are, are, are definitely dominate research and are dominating, and, and really there's no, almost no regulation at all. Um, getting different governments around the world to work together on anything obviously is, <laughs> is <hard>. very difficult. <laughs> uh, um, but I think individual governments certainly are doing something to start controlling and regulating these systems. You know, Europe, I think, is the European Union has, has uh, led the way on their data protection laws. Um, and much more than than any other government. Um, the, the United States, I, I don't know about, I, I don't know a lot about government regulation right now, but I think, you know, in the United States, there's been some pushback on certain technologies like facial recognition. Yes has been be, begun to become regulated in, in certain applications because it's unreliable and it has biases. Um, but I think it's, you know, as usual, technology is much, go, goes at a much faster pace than, than people's ability to think about how to regulate it or pol political uh, progress in that area. But it's kind of analogous to say genetic engineering, which is yeah. another technology that has <laughs> You know some extremely beneficial potential but also a lot of negative possibility and you know our governments we do have a at least uh i don't know about in brazil but here in the us we have you know the fda the drug mm -hmm. federal drug administration uh that that tries to make regulations about kinds of you know that kind of thing and something like that for ai would be i think a big step forward i agree with that so two last questions uh, from Thais. Aren't predictions about AI heavily, heavily um, influenced by what we expect it to be? Big tech companies are making predictions in a way that it's almost like a prompt so we can invest our money on it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the predictions, yeah, are, are certainly... Um, influenced by our expectations and, and, and company, you know, companies are definitely making predictions that try and help themselves in certain ways. So that there is that kind of dynamic at work for sure. I have another one from Jean Ajna. Thoughts on the idea of symbiosis between humans and technology like Neuralink from Elon Musk's company? as an answer to avoid AI to completely replace us. I think that's still, uh, uh, that is still us being very dependent on technology, but that's just me. Well, <laughs> that's uh, an intriguing one. Uh, yeah. Back to you, Melanie, what do you think? <laughs> well, the neural, neural link thing, if, if people aren't familiar with it, you know, there's this idea that um, we can someday um, link ourselves our brains to machines in such a way that we we can um, outsource some of our cognition uh, and um, I don't know what but anyway I, I, I think that uh, I'm a little bit skeptical because I think a lot of neuroscientists um, are critical of, of this work and, and think that we really don't know enough about the brain to be able to achieve these kinds of technologies at least any time in the near future. So I'm not sure that's going to be the way to, uh, to solve yeah. this problem. <laughs> to close, uh, I'd like to close with a very nice question from Edgar Lira from Pukirio. Uh, don't you agree that massive human computer interaction is changing our general dealing with the world? How do we evaluate the reverse problem? It has uh, the possibility of people coming out to think more and more like AIs, GPT-3, for instance, especially what kind of digital literacy do you think should be fostered in our regular education? 
That's uh, a, that's a nice. I like it. That girl, <laughs> very nice one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that I, it definitely is changing uh, humans. So our dealing, you know, our dealing with AI certainly um, affects how we interact with computers. You know, we have a mo model of how the AI works, and so we try and adjust our interactions to those models. Uh, even unconsciously, perhaps. Uh, what kind of dig digital literacy should be fostered? Well, that's a big question. I don't think I could answer that in the one minute left, but uh, <laughs> that's something I think we all should be thinking about. And, and you know, universities have to really think about how they can adjust their education to make sure their students are all digitally li literate. So Thank I'll you very much. You guys think about it. <laughs> Melanie, it was a great discussion. Thank you for your time and kindness for accepting meeting us uh, today. And everyone here in the audience, thank you also for joining. Uh, I wish you all a great uh, afternoon, uh, end of morning and evening for those in other places. Thank you very much. Uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Bye-bye.